Circuit 42 would like to thank Pop Culture Paradise, Toy Anxiety, The Spawn Point Gamers Lounge, and Dragon's Lair San Antonio. Hello, boys and girls, and people who feed them. This is Neil Ross, the voice of Shipwreck and G.I. Joe, saying make sure to check out Circuit42.com and keep riding the circuit. Now you know, and knowing is half the battle. Hello, and welcome to a special episode of Circuit 42 and Film Circuit Breakdown. My name is Ian McIntosh, and I'm here with my co-host... Frank Jordan. And with us, we have our special guest that we have successfully kidnapped and brought to the studio today, Mr. Neil Ross! Woo! Hi, guys. Hi, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Hi, Mr. Ross. I hope the, uh, the car ride in that trunk... In the, I hope the car ride in the trunk wasn't too bumpy. No, I got used to it. Okay, after, after the first couple hours. I've been kidnapped before. So, it's like life of a voice actor, it happens. Sure. So, for those who don't know, let's start off right away. Who are you, and what do you do? Boy, that's an intimidating question. Well, you know my name. Uh, I'm a person who, at a very young age, became fascinated, for some reason, with voices and accents that I would hear coming out of the radio or the little record player that I had. And uh, without any thought of turning it into a profession or a way to make money, but for the pure pleasure of it, I used to sit in a room and sort of imitate things that I heard on the radio and in, uh, coming out of the record player. And that uh, very circuitously led me to a voiceover career, but... Uh, Prior to that, there was uh, about 20 years of radio as a disc jockey and a production guy. And how I got involved in that is uh, another story, which I'll be happy to tell you if you want to hear it. But I am someone who was fortunate enough to turn uh, a hobby or, or a passion into an avocation. And I think people who get to do that are the luckiest people on the planet. Because uh, you, you never go to work with that feeling of, oh, i got to go to that place and do that job I hate. Uh, most of the time, uh, you're thrilled with what you're going to do that day, and you can't wait to get started. It's a great way to live. That sounds like the exact opposite of my day. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sorry, you know. Uh, no, I mean, I, that's not, I'm not saying that in a snarky way. I mean, I... I I have in my life had to do things I didn't want to and that I didn't enjoy. I was stuck in the military for two years. That was no party. So I know the feeling, and I, you have my sympathies. <laughs> well, thank you. So, um, some of the well, some of the main roles that some of the main roles that you're known for are on uh, GI Joe and Shipwreck. And uh, your work on and your work on Transformers as well as Bone Crusher, Hook, and Springer. Um, mm -hmm. Now these were these were pretty big parts of your voice acting career as far as just the how long these show, how long these shows went. Uh, what was it What was it like moving to you know playing playing a such an extensive role on a show as opposed to a lot of the voice acting roles you've done, where you've been like two three episodes, you know played a few played a few characters on like a pilot or something like that. What was it like doing a, a longer-lasting project like that? Well, of course, prior to that, I had done Voltron. Yep. And that, we ended up doing, I believe, 125 of those. Wow. wow. So I was sort of used to that kind of thing. And then <clears throat> G.I. Joe and Transformers... It wasn't like anybody said, uh, you're going to play this big part in a hugely successful show that uh, will be revered 30 years from now. No one had any idea that any of that would happen. It was just, uh, well, you got this part, and uh, he's in the next episode, and after that, who knows? And uh, periodically the phone would ring, and the agent would say, well, they want you for G.I. Joe again, and... Uh, 
So, I mean, it, it just sort of happened day by day, week by week. It wasn't, uh, I don't think any of us had any idea what we were getting into or what it was going to turn into. It was just uh, a job, you know. So, um, what are the questions then in regards to that? Like, you've done a lot of voice acting work. Uh, what is, and what, you know, while you said yourself, you know, every voice acting work is very much that it's a job. Is there a particular is there a particular character that you enjoy playing more so than any more so than any of the others? Well, probably a number of them. I shouldn't have just said it was a job. I mean, we were happy to be doing the work. As I said, this is what I love to do. But the point that I was trying to get across was that maybe somebody had a master plan in New York or wherever, but we were never told exactly how many episodes they planned on doing or how many episodes we might be involved in. It was just it, we took it on a day-to-day, week-to-week basis. And it wasn't until we were practically through with everything we suddenly realized what a large body of work we had been part of. But initially, it was just, well, you're working on Tuesday, and that's all we knew. Uh, so, to, so I didn't want to make it sound like, uh, you know, I was I was... Uh, not not enthusiastic about the work or what have you. Uh, as far as favorite characters, uh, well, I'm very fond of uh, Keith and Voltron. That was the first big lead role I got in a big uh, series. And you never forget something like that. It, uh, it was an extraordinary experience. A shipwreck is a lot of fun to play uh, <clears throat> because he he is conflicted. Virtually every other character in, in G.I. Joe, uh, you know, the good guys were really good and the bad guys were really bad. But Shipwreck was this uh, screw up. He wanted to do the right thing, but he didn't like taking orders. And so he would try to do things his way and get into trouble and somehow muddle through. And, that, and that, that gave the character a lot of colors and shadings and made it much more fun to play than just a one-note a good guy or, or bad guy. So he's, he's a particular favorite. And then another one that, sadly, nobody remembers uh, was from, in a show called Attack of the Killer Tomatoes. I remember for that. <laughs> and, Oh, good. I'm glad you remember. Uh, well, I played this uh, egotistical uh, newsman named Whitley White, who was in love with the sound of his own voice. And it was very, very well written. It was a very clever thing. I mean, the show took place in this little mythical town in California that appeared to only have one broadcaster in it, and that was Whitley. If you turned the radio on, there he was. If you turned the TV on, there he was. Sometimes on television, he would be anchoring the newscast and throw it to himself in the field. <laughs> <laughs> with, with no explanation of how that could possibly happen. And I just had so much fun playing that part because I sort of based it on a rather pompous uh, newscaster in, in the Los Angeles area of a bygone era. A guy who was obviously in love with the sound of his own voice. And, uh, I mean, most of the time they would write these wonderful speeches for me and most of the time I was this close to just cracking up with laughter. At, at the whole thing, I, I, I just I wouldn't quite break up, but I was awful close many, many, many times, and I enjoyed him immensely. That, like looking back at that show, I mean, yeah, that was a really funny, really clever show, and even though it didn't, I wish it had lasted longer. But you look at the cast of it, you just had this fantastic cast of um, you know either like voice actors who were either veterans at the time or up and coming, and you had. Mm-hmm. Some, you, know, you had you, you had Cam Clark, Maurice LaMarche, Chuck McCann, Rob Paulson, and then, of course, John Astin playing um, Gangrene. Yeah. I mean, it was a wonderful cast. It was well written. I think what happened, and this happened more than once uh, shows that I was involved in, they gave it the wrong time slot. Uh, and I, uh, if memory serves... And, uh, you know, if, it, if it's on too early in the morning, all you get are really young kids who want to watch something like Winnie the Pooh. And they're entitled to. God bless them. I remember when my daughter was that age. Perfectly appropriate for her. Not ready for something like Attack of the Killer Tomatoes. But they would put it on way too early. 
And by the time the older kids got up, it was gone, and, uh, and they never got a chance to see it. And I, I, I really wonder sometimes about the people that schedule these shows. Do they even think about it? Well, I remember uh, growing up in St. Louis, uh, I remember uh, when Attack of the Killer Tomatoes came on. It came on so late in the morning. Um, there, was, there was a certain time of the day when that came on. Also on the other channel, Soul Train came on. Once Soul mm -hmm. Train came on, it was time to go outside. So, <laughs> so well, I think, I, you know, I tend to get these shows mixed up. This also might, I, I seem to recall we got preempted by basketball a lot. So yeah, maybe it wasn't on. Maybe it was. Maybe it was another show I was thinking of that was on too early. Whatever it was, that the time slot didn't help. But they did bring the show back, and that's really only happened twice in my whole career where they brought a show back. But they they did bring Tomatoes back, and we did a few more. It just never seemed to get over the hump, if you will, which is a shame. But I think in many ways. Huh? Can I ask a question real quick? Yes. Oh, you know, um, being, uh, back in the G.I. Joe days, uh, when you were shipwrecked, which is like my favorite character of, of all time on G.I. Joe, he uttered one of the best lines of all time to me. At the end of the episode, he, you straight up said, it's time for a frosty round of Yo Joe Cola. And I, that is always stuck with me forever and I, I've been looking for Yo Jo Cola on the store shelves. <laughs> well maybe they should have maybe they should have marketed it. I have no memory of that line. I they mean I'm should. sure I'm sure it happened. I'm glad you enjoyed it. <laughs> that one has been wiped from the memory banks. <laughs> it was like the best line. They should have marketed it. It was a missed opportunity because I think at that time Yo Jo Cola with a soul. It's a great name. <laughs> right? I get, that, get, that, get that Ecto Cooler market. The Ecto Cooler market. You know? Yeah. Exactly. Well, so, another, another missed opportunity. And I could have been the spokesman. I could have made a fortune. But... Should have, yeah. yeah. It's never too late. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm afraid it is. <laughs> <laughs> You, know, you get like this really awkward, like you you can totally tell it's an animation of shipwreck from the eighties, and then like just just trying to put it on TV, and it's like you should buy Yo Jo Cola today, <laughs> except it's like your voice now, Neil, and it's like <laughs> it's like, it's pretty one of those where like you can tell that they're that they're kind of half hearty it and just making a commercial with just some animation they found. Mm hmm. And it's just your voice throughout the whole thing, and then a new voice comes in. Yo, Joe Cola! And then it's like back to your voice. <laughs> oh, I see what you... Yeah. Well, my fa my favorite is the really cheesy commercials where they use a different voice for the phone number. Oh, yeah. Because <laughs> I don't know, I guess they're too cheap to get the guy that did the main body of the spot, so it uh, sounds something like... So call this number right now. Five 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 two two nine nine. Don't forget that. Five 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 two two nine nine. It's like I just I I look at that and I say, you know, are you guys out of your minds? <laughs> totally smooth. No one will notice. <laughs> no one will notice. And and the thing is, they probably don't. I'm the only one. But. <laughs> Whenever I hear that, I know it. Don't buy that product. <laughs> right. Yeah. So I just call this one nine hundred number. Nothing bad will happen to your credit card. Well, I, I mean, this is not what, why we got together to talk. But uh, the thing that cracks me up about infomercials is they just about have me sold. I really am going to whip out the credit card and call the number or whatever. But then they start with, "But wait, there's more." And pretty soon they're going to give you a car for 50 cents. And it's like, wait a minute, this can't be le legit. These knives can't be worth a damn if they're going to give them to me that cheap. If they'd have stuck with the original price and just shut up, I probably would have bought the thing. But when they start piling on the extra goodies, you suddenly realize this has to be a scam. And I put the credit card back in the wallet and, 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 and move on. 
I, I wonder wonder how many other people do that. I just picture the awkward moment when Neil gets a box of knives. It's like, hey, these are made of plastic. Yeah. Damn you, cut co. <laughs> so, um, one of the things I wanted to ask about, like, it's very much a guilty pleasure for me from, like, the late 80s, early 90s, is the uh, Pride of the X-Men pilot. Um, I know it was only just the one episode, but the, yeah. one, the one thing that always stood out to me was that the the voice of Wolverine. Now, the weird thing is, like, they had Nightcrawler as German, and, it, <clears throat> and I thought it was pretty great. But I always wondered, the Australian Wolverine, I just... It's more of a it's more of a commentary. I just thought it was so funny that they, yeah, you know, with Nightcrawler. I don't know. I don't know if it was a cho- if something like that. Generally, is a choice of the it was a choice of the um, of the director on the show, or if it's like something that the voice actor chooses to give Wolverine an Australian accent. But I just always thought that was interesting. Yeah. No. That that's uh, usually the it is not the actor's choice. You. You come in and uh, we want this, we want that, we want the other. It's usually been decided by <clears throat> the producers who communicate their desires to the director. And, uh, you know, if it's an incidental character that's just doing a few lines, nobody cares. And the director might say, well, it's a cop. What do you want to do? And you say, well, I could do the cliche Irish. Uh, What's going on over here? You know, this kind of thing. Or rough or you know and you play with it and 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 you figure out something on the spot but with major characters no they've they've decided what they want accent wise and uh, everything i just thought I, although you think about it in retrospect i mean those guys were pioneers i mean get another australian playing wolverine what 13 years later 11 years later something like that yeah yeah well, we must have been psychic. I don't know. I'm assuming. It's, it's either that or like, that Paul Hogan is really popular, and I'm sure he'll be around forever. Let's make him Australian. Why? Well, we did this light of cocaine, and we thought it was a great idea. Well, I don't know about the cocaine part, but the, uh, yeah, you're right. Paul Hogan was a big deal right around then. So maybe that, you know, who knows? Who knows? Don't, don't forget about Yahoo Serious. Right. <laughs> The wow. most successful actor of all time. <laughs> I remember uh, driving past Warner Brothers Studios in Burbank, and they have outside the studio these huge uh, uh, billboards for various shows and things that they're doing in the studio. And I remember there was this huge billboard for him, and it's like, what the hell's and you look at it and you wonder, is, is this guy going to be huge and I'll be hearing about him for the rest of my life or will he d- disappear? <laughs> and, you know, I will never forget, uh, they called me in to do a, it wasn't even a, a promo that was going to be heard on the air. It was just to play for the affiliate stations. And it was to introduce them to this new show that was coming on. And I, I remember the, the person who was directing the session saying, Boy, I don't know, this, uh, this looks like a piece of crap to me. I, uh, I, you know, well, who the hell knows, but, uh, I, you know, if this lasts ten minutes, it'll be a miracle. And it was the um, uh, Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. Wow. <laughs> wow. It lasted you know, a little more than ten minutes. Yeah, and uh, <clears throat> you just never know. Some, you know, something comes along, and uh, it it could be huge, or it could just sink like a rock and never be heard from again. You just you just don't know. <clears throat> That's one of my favorite lines about show business. It's from a book called Adventures in the Screen Trade, uh, written by uh, William Goldman. He was, he's a screenwriter. He wrote the screenplay for Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid and also for All the President's Men. And I think the first line of the book is the rule number one in Hollywood is nobody knows anything. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> and, it, and it's true. I mean, they all come on like experts, but in the, in the, in the, in the end, nobody really knows anything. If they did, they'd, you know, they'd make billions and, and never have a flop. 
but even the biggest of them have flops. You just don't know. It's such a gamble. There was yeah, a... Um, sorry. I was just going to say, there was a great story by the writer Brian Michael Bendis, who's a comic book and screenwriter, and he was shopping around a script for torso, the, uh, the um, torso, based off the torso killer. And mm. whenever he would explain to people, he would say, well, you see, it's about, it's, um, it's about the first American serial killer. And it was, about, and he started talking about how it was actually Elliot Ness who investigated the murder and how it basically destroyed his career as, a, as a, uh, destroyed his career as an agent. And, um, every single person asked him, Oh, is this based off the TV show? Mm. Is this is this based off um is this based off the Kevin Costner movie? Mm. And every single conversation was Elliot Ness is a real person. <laughs> no, 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 I saw the TV show. No, he was a real person, I promise. <laughs> and no one in Hollywood would believe that Elliot Ness is a real person. Every single person he talked to thought he was just a character from a movie or TV show. Isn't that interesting? Well, you know, time time marches on, and um, you get you got a you got a bunch of young people who uh, <clears throat> who who were never exposed to the original guy, and they they, they think it's fictional. Yeah, it's uh, the thing that used to fascinate me because of when I was a young person, I saw a lot of uh, television shows in the late 50s and early 60s not realizing most of a lot of them were based on older movies it's like uh, rawhide which introduced a very young uh, unknown clint eastwood to the world was basically uh, based on the movie red river with john wayne and montgomery clift but I'd never heard of that, so I thought I was looking at some original concept. And there were there were a bunch of a bunch of shows like that. And, and ultimately, I would catch up with the older movie and go, "Oh God, that's where they got the idea." Oh, I see. Okay, you know, it's just um, you know, you just don't have the information. For me, it was kind of like that was kind of me with the movie The Fugitive when it came out. I was like ten. And mm. I just love the. I, I probably should not have been watching The Fugitive at the age of ten, in retrospect, especially with the beginning of the movie. But um, eh. but I'm like when I'm watching it, it's like this is the coolest movie ever. It's so original. It's so awesome. And the Fugitive is a good movie. I had no idea until my parents pointed out that it was based off this black and white TV show. But I had the kind of family that you don't see much nowadays, unfortunately, where they were actually they actually made the extra effort to go out and find the TV show. So I could actually be exposed to both. And the, what did you think? What did you think of the TV show? I liked it. I, 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 I yeah, I loved it. It was a great show. But, yeah, I, I, my memory. I haven't seen it in ages, but my memory of it was for that era. It was pretty damn good. I'm just trying to remember. And, sorry. And, and it, well, it was a good concept in that. He was constantly on the move, so he would always be in a new town with new people and new complications. And then once he had sort of resolved the problem, whatever it was, he would have to move on because Lieutenant Gerard was coming. And Lieutenant Gerard was played by a Canadian actor named Barry Morse, who I had seen a lot in Canada when I was a kid. And I was thrilled that he had this great uh, job in Hollywood. And then, of course, the announcer, as I recall, was the great uh, William Conrad, who, who had, a, had an astonishing career in radio and then went on to do some TV. He was in Jake and the Fat Man, if you remember that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, um for new about uh, radio, back in your radio days, what market were you in? When I was working as a disc jockey, you mean? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I started out in a, a, some funny little places, but the bulk of my career was, I, I, I say I made the great uh, Pacific Circle route 
uh, Honolulu, San Diego, San Francisco, and Los Angeles. Nice. I used to I used to do uh, I used to do radio back in the days, and I used to uh, back in the day, uh, <laughs> back in the nineties, and uh, uh, along with my duties, I was I, I was uh, tasked with doing the station IDs. Mm-hmm. So. And I, lo- I worked for Clear Channel at that time, so I had to do station IDs for tons of other radio stations. So, uh, so when I did the station IDs, uh, people didn't believe it was me because I, they said, you know, have fun with it. You know, have you ever you, you've cut station IDs, haven't you? Oh sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And they tell you they tell you that you know have fun with it because you're doing a lot yeah. of them. So mm-hmm. you know I. I developed this radio voice, you know, I, I used to, every time I was like, you are listening to Q104, the planet's hottest music, and, and people would just say, that's you? That doesn't sound like you. Have you had any of those interactions with, with, with fans who meet you live, and they're like, well, that doesn't sound like you on the radio? Um, not not really, not that I can recall. The um, what you always get is, uh, hey, you're a lot different from the way I pictured you, and <laughs> the implication kind of being, uh, Jesus, I thought you were good looking, and obviously not. And uh, some people used to tell me they always pictured me wearing a suit and tie, which is something I abhor and never do. I suppose I was I was too formal on here. I don't know. Well, I always got a, I thought you'd be taller and white. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, Frank, you're not white? <laughs> you should, had, should have told him I'm trying, you know. <laughs> <laughs> You've had me fooled all these years that I've known you in person. Yeah, when, when I do, when I did remotes, people would come up and just totally pass me up. And when I start talking, they would come over to the table like, I thought I just heard Frank. I was like, yeah, that's me. Mm. You're not, you're not Frank. I thought you, I thought you were white. <laughs> there was a um, one of our one of our guests that we had on here, a comic artist named Jim Mafood. He was talking about the wow. stupidest questions he had ever gotten while at a convention. My favorite <clears throat> had to be, and he said this on the air. Guy walks up to him, big dude, really big dude, bunch of stuff in his arms. I thought you were black. And he just said, "Well, <laughs> I'm, well, I'm part Arabic, so I guess that." In certain parts of this country, that makes me half black. Mm. <laughs> I, I, that's why I love Jim. The fact that he'll just say that to a guy at a convention. Yeah, and the guy didn't get it either at all. Well, it's uh, conventions are you just you you just don't know what you're going to encounter. Well, yeah. Uh, remember when you were at Texas Comic Con and you met that weirdo Ian McIntosh? God, what a freak! <laughs> Well, it, it just uh, you you uh, most of the time you have a great experience and once in a while, not so much. But uh, <laughs> what was your what was your worst experience at a con? You know, I've been pretty lucky. Um, I really haven't had a, a worst experience. You know, it's just sometimes. Um, you know, somebody comes over and you you chat with them and answer questions and sign something, and they just linger and linger and linger, and you get the feeling like they want something more, but you don't know what it is, and you don't know quite how to how to please them, and uh, and maybe it's all maybe it's all in my mind, but they just seem to ultimately go away unsatisfied. And I don't know what they wanted from me. <laughs> a, a, a joke? I don't know what. But <laughs> I, I'll admit there was one time I was actually concerned that I was doing that at a convention, and then it was with um, another voice actor you might know, Paul Ivey. Mm-hmm, sure. And because um, we were we were hanging out, we were just talking about uh, Toxic Crusaders and Lloyd Kaufman and all this different stuff. And yeah, I'm assuming in many ways, at, at many times, he probably doesn't get a chance to talk about you know, working with um, the guys at Trauma very much. So I, I figured that'd be kind of something cool to bring up since I'm a huge Trauma fan. And I was kind of worried that I was lingering or something, you know, or something of that nature. And then he starts bringing out Metal Gear Solid pictures. And it's like, okay, I'm not, not worried anymore. Because he's the one pulling out Metal Gear pictures to show me. 
Well, I just, uh, just some people, I feel like uh, they went away disappointed, and I, I wish, I wish I knew what they wanted, and I wish I had been able to give it to them. But, or maybe it's just me being paranoid. I don't know. But I, I really haven't had any bad experiences at conventions. Um, okay, Bill, you're on one of my favorite Adult Swim uh, cartoons, Harvey Birdman, Attorney at Law. Oh, you and my you and my daughter, she loved it too. So I, that is that is one of the greatest shows ever. <laughs> and you were the voice of Doctor Ben Quest. That was so awesome. What was it? What was it like to work? Did you work directly with Stephen uh, Colbert with with um, with most of the uh, with most of the cast? Were you in the same place, or do you guys do it from different places? No, I'm pretty. Sh my memory of that is that we. I did all my lines uh, alone, <clears throat> which I assume everybody else did, not they just glued it all together. Oh. But uh, th that was, I, I had some success uh, in, in matching some of uh, the late uh, Don Messick's uh, voices. Right. And uh, he had played that part originally, and I was able to get pretty close to what he did, I thought. That and the, was, con was really good. the concept was so clever. Uh, when I saw what they had done, I just I cracked up. It was it was very very clever. And yeah, uh, it, was, it was great. I, I I enjoyed that series. It was it was so awesome. I mean, it, it's it's an honor to speak with you because you know I'm a, I mean along with Ian, we both are voiceover. Uh, voiceover guy, we love the part of voiceover, and I mean it's, it's just an honor to speak with you, sir. Oh, thank you. It's my pleasure. And well, you guys are probably like me. I, you know, you lock into a voice, <clears throat> and you um, you may not even know the guy's name, but you, it's like, oh, there you are. I I remember. Not the, not the when I initially saw it or saw them, but later when I acquired uh, uh, videotapes and then later DVDs of the uh, Clint Eastwood spaghetti westerns that he did in Italy, uh, those were dubbed into English. And a lot of the voice people they used to dub those characters did a lot of commercial work in, in New York. And I had heard a lot of those guys in commercials for years. And to this day, I don't know their names, but I would hear like two syllables. The guy would be doing a bartender or something, you know, and I would go, there he is. I don't know who he, I don't even know his name, but I've heard his voice for years. I'm glad he's still around. I'm glad he got a job, you know. Mm -hmm. I, I can relate to that because I grew up on Italian horror, like Dario Gento and that kind of thing. And I, it's, I'm watching the movie and it's like, I'm pretty sure that Italian guy doesn't sound like that in real life. And then no. I start hearing the more and more voices, and I start connecting more and more of the other movies. So I just started watching a whole lot of Italian films. But one of the things that I noticed is that they know, as they were getting bigger and bigger in America, they would actually start using a lot of the same English actors for specific actresses. Mm. Like, there's this really... I can't remember her name, but there's this really airheaded looking actress who's in a lot of Italian movies and Spanish films uh, back in the 70s and 80s. And mm -hmm. they started using the same, literally airheaded sounding uh, English voiceover actress for her. So it's like mm -hmm. they picked an actor who was just equally as bad as her perform physical performance. And I always thought that was kind of great, while well, kind of mean at the same time. Yeah, it, there was a Wonderful show. It only ran once on CBS. It was called The 25 Lira Escape. And it was about the Italian movie industry in the 60s. I don't know if this is still true, but back then they didn't shoot any sound. Uh, they dubbed everything. Yep. And uh, they showed a scene from some gladiator movie, and I don't know, Steve Reeves or somebody who looked like him, you know, with the big packs and the beard and the sword. And he speaks like, well, they were speaking Italian, but it was, you know, he was down here like this, and then the heroine, this lovely voice. And, and then they cut away from the picture, and they cut to the dubbing stage, and the guy who's doing the, 
the Steve Reeves voice is about five feet one and fat and bald. <laughs> but he's got this wonderful voice. And the woman who's playing the heroine is about a foot and a half taller than him and also rather zoftig. <laughs> I mean, the, con the contrast between the characters they're playing, the sounds of the voices and the actual physical uh, people it was just hilarious. And, uh, well, as Michael Bell says, our, our characters are always much better looking than we are. <laughs> and, uh... I don't you can't, you can't look like shipwreck. <laughs> Well, I, at this point, I kind of look like Shipwreck's grandfather, I think. <laughs> <laughs> there was a time I might have gotten away with it. I toyed with the idea of dressing up like him at conventions, and I thought it would just be too sad. This old guy in a sailor suit. No, I don't think I'm going to go there. <laughs> oh, no, you should do it. You should totally do it. I think I just think I'll wear the bad sport coat and let, let it go with that. I know with um, I saw Jeremy Bullock at a convention. The actor played Boba Fett, and he's about the same exact size and everything mm -hmm. like build wise that he was when he played Boba Fett. And apparently, these this Boba Fett cosplay group actually they sent him an email. They're corresponding with them, and they said, um, "We we want to surprise you. Uh, what are what are your exact?" What are your exact like measurements? Like, if we wanted to make something for you, like it's pretty clear what it was, but mm -hmm. they didn't want to tell him exactly. And so he told them, and they met him at the con, and they had the entire Boba Fett armor made sized for him as he is as he is today. Mm -hmm. And he was actually at the convention in the original in the Boba Fett armor that looked straight out of the original movie. Well, that was very sweet of him. Wally Burr has never gone to uh, the Army Surplus store and bought me a shipwreck outfit. <laughs> we should call him right now. Like, what the we hell should. are you doing, Wally? You What's the matter with you, Wally? You go to the store. <laughs> but, it's like, but it's like midnight. No, we don't care. Go to the store. Once, once again, another missed opportunity. <laughs> I could probably put the whole shipwreck costume together for about five ninety eight. You know, That'd be awesome. The most expensive thing would be the tattoo. Right. If you don't have it, all the fans are disappointed and all of a sudden. It's like, oh, I'm not watching this YouTube video anymore. I'm done. Not with yeah. this podcast. Hey, I, I will draw the tattoo for you. I'll draw money. <laughs> That's the only way I'll I'll do it. I'm I'm not a tattoo person. <laughs> So, uh, something you had kind of a unique experience as a voice actor with uh, Voltron, considering yeah. that you were actually both in the original Voltron series and the CGI Voltron: The Third Dimension that apparently myself and five that five other people remember. I remember that. You were was one it one of the five? Was it yeah. five other people? I, I didn't think it was that many. Um, well, I, yeah, I mentioned earlier on that there were only two shows in my career that ever came back. And uh, that that was the other one, Attack of the Killer Tomatoes, and that one. And um, I, I don't know what the problem was. I, I, of course, it was that new type of animation. I don't know what that's called. Uh, CGI. Yeah, it didn't uh, it didn't it didn't look the same. And I don't know, maybe that was the problem. But I thought for the time it was pretty advanced, honestly. Like compared to a lot of what was on TV. Mm-hmm. Well, it was kind of early CGI. Maybe that was the problem. And well, it was one of those things. It was one of those things where it, it, it's Voltron, and Voltron is beloved by everyone. And if you mess with that formula, even the slightest, people will will rebel against it. And I think that's what happened. Could be. Could be. Uh, like I say, nobody knows anything. Or like <laughs> William Goldman says, nobody knows anything. So I'll just let you know, I still, I mean, Voltron started off in St. Louis, and me being a kid from St. Louis, I I used to skip homework just to watch it. It was, it was just the best show ever. I still have my Voltron Force membership. <laughs> so you're the reason, uh, or we're the reason you never graduated from high school, is it? Yeah. <laughs> 
I was gonna say, and also I learned nothing throughout high school. <laughs> You're still working on that GED. Right. <laughs> Don't worry, you can have a GED in hotel development. <laughs> you know what GED means? Good enough diploma. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, this is not why you called to talk to me, but one of the things that's always uh, infuriated me was, I, I, I remember, this probably happened to you guys too, the principal would, uh, something would happen and he would say, you know, if, if this isn't corrected, you will not get your high school diploma, and without a high school diploma, your life is ruined. <laughs> and uh, you've got to have that high school diploma. And so I got the high school diploma and never in my life has anyone ever asked to see it. <laughs> well, I could have lied to people. Yeah, of course I'm a high school graduate. What's the matter with you? Look at no. me, I have glasses. Clearly I graduated high school. <laughs> I mean, I used to bring it with me. You sure you don't want No, we don't need to see that. <laughs> I, I have a I have a master's in media arts, and no one has ever asked to see it either. So I. <laughs> You're like, sir, you talk good. You're you've obviously graduated. Well, there are certain uh, professions, I guess, where you need uh, a degree, and you you need to be able to document it. But it seems like anything in the creative arts. They're more concerned with what you can do than 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 what any sort of a a degree. You know what I mean? Yeah, that is true. Because like I always say, just because you have the degree doesn't mean you know anything. <laughs> well, as I say, in the creative arts, it's all about what what you can do. Right. And you say, well, I also I have a degree, and well, that's that's nice. Let me let me see a sample of your work. <laughs> Or hear a sample of your work, or whatever. And if if they like that, they could care less where you went to school and what you did while you were there. Yeah, like I'm working for a um, for like a big sales company, and um, I'm doing well. And it somehow doesn't relate at all to my English degree. Hmm. I don't think they cared about my English degree. But I think that was my first mistake was getting an English degree. <laughs> Well, I don't know. Maybe I'm a maybe I'm a Pollyanna, but I, I the older I get, the more I think no experience is ultimately a complete waste of time. You somehow end up using it, maybe not in the way that it, it was intended to be used, or not in a way you thought you might use it. But ultimately, you do make use of it one way or another. Yeah, we we have you on every show. Like we run into someone gets mad, and you're like, "Don't worry, you can make a positive out of that." But I'm bleeding heavily from the head. Ah, don't worry. At least you're not bleeding heavily from the head. Don't worry. You'll use you'll use this experience later. <laughs> it's like the newest segment for Positive Deal. Yeah. Well, one of my favorite lines is, "Quit complaining. Twenty years from now, you'll be calling these the good old days." <laughs> <laughs> And it's true, you know. I, I said to my daughter, uh, "Enjoy." I said, "Really enjoy and savor these years right now, because, uh, man, you can look back on this period very fondly." I know it doesn't seem like it right at the moment, but trust me, you will. Nice. <laughs> so, um, before we before we bring the show to a close, I just wanted to ask: Do you have any new projects coming out that you want to talk about? Well, you know, people ask me that, and what's been happening of late in the business, I don't know why, people have become terribly concerned about their ideas uh, being ripped off, and more and more when we work or audition, we're asked to sign these um, non-disclosure agreements, where if we reveal anything about this project, uh, we can be sued, and they can come and take away our firstborn child, and... So I've just sort of, I don't talk about anything until it's on the air or in the stores or whatever. So I appreciate the opportunity, but I'm just going to remain mum. And that way I don't have to worry about uh, litigation. Not a problem. Not a problem. So where can people find you on this wonderful, wonderful Internet? 
Well, I have a website. It's not designed for fans per se, although I have no problem with somebody logging on and doing whatever they want to do. It has samples of uh, various uh, kinds of voiceover that I do. It has some video uh, samples of stuff that I've done and a um, little biography and that sort of thing, and that can all be found at uh, neilross.com, N-E-I-L-R-O-S-S.com. I paid a consultant a fortune to come up with that name. <laughs> and um, that's that's pretty much where you can find me. Well, as we bring the show to a close, um, thank, you again for ha- thank you again for coming on the show. It's great to have you on. Oh, sure. My pleasure. I'm, uh, it, was a, it was nice chatting with you guys. All right, and I'm Ian McIntosh. This is my co-host, Greg Jordan. And thank you for listening, and hopefully you listen to the end of this new, the newest episode of Film Circuit Breakdown here at circuit42.com. <laughs>